I'm here with disturbing news about our favorite gadgets, cell phones, tablets, Wi-Fi, etc. Putting it bluntly, they are damaging the living cells in our bodies and killing many of us prematurely. I'm Dr. Martin Blank from the Department of Physiology and Cellular Biophysics at Columbia University. It is distressing for me and more than 160 colleagues who today are petitioning the United Nations requesting that they address this problem. We are scientists and engineers, and I am here to tell you we have created something that is harming us, and it is getting out of control. Before Edison's light bulb, there was very little electromagnetic radiation in our environment. The levels today are very many times higher than natural background levels and are growing rapidly because of all the new devices that emit this radiation. An example that a lot of us have in our pockets right now is the cell phone. One study shows that as cell phone usage has spread widely, the incidence of fatal brain cancer in younger people has more than tripled. We are putting cellular antennas on residential buildings and on top of hospitals where people are trying to get well. Wireless utility meters and cell towers are blanketing our neighborhoods with radiation. It's particularly frightening that radiation from our telecommunication and power line technology is damaging the DNA in our cells. It is clear to many biologists that this can account for the rising cancer rates. Future generations, our children, are at risk. These biologists and scientists are not being heard on the committees that set safety standards. The biological facts are being ignored, and as a result, the safety limits are much too high. They are not protective. More protection will probably result from full disclosure of possible conflicts of interest between regulators and industry. Rising exposure to electromagnetic radiation is a global problem. The World Health Organization and international standard-setting bodies are not acting to protect the public's health and well-being. International exposure guidelines for electromagnetic fields must be strengthened to reflect the reality of their impact on our bodies, and in particular, on our DNA. Although we are still in the midst of a great technological transformation, the time to deal with the harmful biological and health effects is long overdue. We are really all part of a large biological experiment without our informed consent. To protect our children, ourselves, and our ecosystem, we must reduce exposure by establishing more protective guidelines. And so today, scientists from around the world are submitting an appeal to the United Nations, its member states, and the World Health Organization to provide leadership in dealing with this emerging public health crisis. Can you tell us about your qualifications to be talking on this subject? What is your experience okay. and what are your qualifications? Yeah, and I'm glad you asked that. Uh, I trained from 1960 uh, microwaves in the Royal Navy and I studied all aspects of microwave technology. Uh, radar, it was used as um, later on booby traps because I was a diver and all divers do bomb disposal. Um, booby traps in mines, um, I studied harmful effects because if you're you didn't, you, in the Navy you don't just look at radar screens, you service the equipment, you you study the dangers of getting yourself exposed. Um, so I did all microwaves. Um, I have a degree from Exeter University in physics. I, for my, I studied nuclear and atomic physics for my final years. And for my dissertation, I looked at the absorption of electromagnetic waves and I looked at the very end of the microwave absorption spectrum into the infrared. I wanted to see that when you got to the end of the microwave frequency would you still absorb it? Uh, and that was my dissertation. I have another degree, an honours degree, from the Council for National Academic Awards where I studied uh, thinking processes and environmental influences on thinking processes. I have my teaching diploma from the Home Office on, in human physiology. 
I taught down here. I, I taught uh, advanced physics in the sixth form, just down the road here, at Ashburton, uh, South Dartmoor, South Devon College. Is it South Dartmoor College? Um, I taught advanced physics, both theoretical and practical, there. Uh, I was commissioned by the Police Federation to write the Tetra report and the subsequent union to write the other report. In fact, I, I technically, no one's actually ever left me alone. Um, I've been in microwaves now since I first took my f three library books out in 1959 to get past my first Navy exam. Uh, so I, I've really been in it since 1959, uh, talking to scientists and travelling the world, uh, talking about this. Uh, since 1959, I, I haven't really let up. Um, I've been questioned all over the world by government scientists, governments, royalty, uh, right around the world. <clears throat> And I've had one question, and, and it's in my paper, I've had one question. When I go to countries, and I'm, I'm not showing off here, I am invariably on television, invariably um, on the radio. Um, and sometimes I'm on the radio before I even get to the country. In, I'm off to America soon to do a lecture with a professor from Washington University. And I'm doing a radio broadcast in two weeks' time, prior to me going. And I have one question in every country, and that is, I wish to be humiliated live on television with somebody from the government or the industry with their extent of their knowledge on microwave irradiation. And I have one question, and my question is, what is the safe level of microwave irradiation for the ovarian follicles in a school child? Joined the Royal Navy uh, in 1960, and I specialised in microwave warfare. Uh, radar, obviously, which uses microwave, but they don't just teach you radar, they teach you all about microwaves and other uses. So I understood about microwave warfare and how it can damage people, how it can harm people. Because microwaves then were used as weapons, as they are today. It is a, a perfect stealth weapon. And when governments don't like a group of people, for instance, the, the ladies who protest at Greenham Common in England about the American missile base, they camped, they were microwaved. We microwaved Catholics in Northern Ireland to make them sick. Uh, it, it goes on all over the world. And it's a weapon that you don't know you're being targeted because the dose is very, very low, which is actually more dangerous than a high dose. It's very, very low and it may take a year or two, but you can, you can cause neurological damage and cancers with low level microwaves and you can make all your opponents sick. It, it's a perfect weapon for a government uh, to use. Wi -Fi, I think anyone who puts Wi-Fi into a school should be locked up for the rest of their life. I really do. I think they're not fit to walk on the surface of this planet because they haven't looked at the research and whatever incentive they have, it is not worth the genetic problems that parents are going to face with their children when they're born. And if you think of a single parent, a mother, who has a genetically deformed child, that that particular mother, mother will feel guilty because she gave birth. She will feel guilty and she will be worried every single second of every single day for her life. She will worry that the child won't marry. 
If the child can marry, she'll worry that the children will carry the disease, which they will. She will worry when she dies who will take care of them. So you are condemning both the family and the children uh, to a lifetime of absolute hell. <clears throat> and this is already published. It is available to look up. It's what I call intentional ignorance. They are offered some sort of incentive and they think, oh, this is going to be good. We'll have it. Now, the problem is, imagine you are a 15-year-old schoolgirl. All of the 400,000 eggs in your ovaries were with you at birth. They're not fully developed, but they're with you. They are 10 times more susceptible to radiation than all of the other DNA in the body. And scientists don't realize that. They don't read all of the papers as I do. So you have this highly susceptible genetic material which is going to make your children. And you are irradiating it because Wi-Fi's, they are transmitters as well as the routers, as well as the ones either side of you. They are all transmitting at this height through your ovaries. So you are risking the damage, the DNA damage, of your child every time you sit down and you use Wi-Fi. And it's like saying, if I smoke a cigarette, which one will cause the damage? The answer is, I don't know. It could be the one today. <clears throat> so you now have a child that has a probability of being genetically damaged. But the real damage is when that child grows up. You have genetic material in your ovaries which could be damaged. Now, the real problem comes... So you, you have a child that could be born genetically damaged. But the real problem comes when you become pregnant, if you are a teacher or a mature student and you become pregnant. Because the embryo inside your womb, in the first 100 days, all of those 400,000 eggs are forming in your embryo, your child's ovaries. <clears throat> So your child could be born with genetically damaged eggs. And the main thing about the eggs in the ovaries of your child is that they have absolutely no protection. It, it hasn't been developed yet. We have a natural protection against microwaves. It was developed since the Stone Age against thunderstorms and massive amounts of radiation coming into our body. But in the, your embryo, your uterus, in the fetus, uh, where your child is developing for the first 100 days, in the ovaries, the eggs do not have that protection. So they are at maximum risk from radiation. And for the first month or so, you wouldn't even know you were pregnant. You wouldn't even be taking precautions. That is the main danger area. So you give birth to a daughter, but her ovaries are now contaminated. She may be normal, she may be genetically damaged, but her ovaries are at the most risk. So when your daughter grows up, and she becomes pregnant and has a baby, this is where one of these eggs will be fertilized and come out. So the real damage here is your grandchildren. That is where it is going to show most. And we already see this in animals that have reproductive cycles of a year or two years or three years. We're already seeing this 
and it has been published by veterinary schools and vets and scientists, so we know this happens. And it's also been documented uh, in the Cold War when women were deliberately microwaved. So we know it does happen. The documents are there. <clears throat> and what you're risking by putting Wi-Fi into schools is the future generations of all of these girls. But it gets worse because this particular DNA, the mitochondrial DNA inside you, and the DNA inside you, the mitochondrial DNA, you can trace unchanged to your mother, her mother, her mother, right the way back to the beginning of the human race in Africa, the Stone Age. You can trace your ancestors, if you could, right back to the very first lady. It is unchanged, the mitochondria. And that is being unchanged in your children, which means if you damage it, your child could be genetically damaged, then her child, and her child, and her child, forever. You are condemning the future generations of every single child until there are no more lines left in the female in your family. You, you must stop. Some, a female must stop producing children for this to stop. <clears throat> so it, when you put Wi-Fi in schools, what you're saying is, for the sake of a little bit of money that saves getting a workman in to drill holes through the walls to, to feed cable because it's cheaper, we're just going to put Wi-Fi in, but you can have genetically damaged children for the rest of your family's career. That's what we're saying. All smartphones come with some information that basically says, don't keep the phone in your pocket. And there's a tremendous amount of sponsored research by people who are hired to do studies to find no effect. It's not a matter of war. It's a matter of the future. Do you really want to have to prove that there's a significant increased risk of brain cancer before taking steps to reduce exposures to prevent that harm from happening?